Good evening. I'm John Worthen, President of Ball State. Welcome to Emmons Auditorium and the Marie Smith Gray Memorial Lecture. Funds for this presentation have been provided by the Eleanor L. Smith Estate. This lecture is a continuation of our effort to stimulate the intellectual climate of the university by bringing to the campus internationally known speakers. And now I'm pleased to present Ms. Susan Keel, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Susan was appointed as the student member of the Board of Trustees by Governor Robert Orr this past summer. She is a senior from Columbus, Indiana, majoring in political science and minoring in telecommunications and German. Susan is president of her sorority, Alpha Chi Omega, and a member of START, the Student Alumni Relations Team. Ms. Susan Keel. Thank you, Dr. Worthen. Good evening, Ball State student, staff, faculty, and visitors. We are fortunate to have with us tonight Dr. Jean Kirkpatrick, President Reagan's appointee as a United States Permanent Representative to the United Nations. She is the first woman to serve this post. After more than four years in the United Nations and as a member of the Cabinet, Ambassador Kirkpatrick has become widely known as a lecturer and one of the most influential political commentators of our time. Dr. Jean Kirkpatrick was born in Duncan, Oklahoma. She received an AA degree from Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri, a BA from Bernard College in New York City, and an MA from Columbia University. In 1955, she married a, fe married a fellow political scientist, Dr. Evren Kirkpatrick, now a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and president of the Board of Trustees of the Helen Dwight Reed Educational Foundation. They have three sons. In 1968, Jean Kirkpatrick earned her PhD from Columbia University, and she is fluent in both French and Spanish. She has received honorary degrees from Georgetown University, Bethany College, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv University, and many other institutions. In addition to being a respected academician, Ambassador Kirkpatrick is a prolific writer. She writes a syndicated column and is the author of five books and numerous articles on foreign policy and American political issues. In the coming months, she expects to write a book on the United States' role at the United Nations and in the world. Ambassador Kirkpatrick has received numerous awards for her political activism, including the Medal of Freedom awarded by President Reagan and the French Prize Politique for her political courage. She has also been active in many professional organizations and has served as a board member of many academic and public service organizations. Since her resignation in 1985, Ambassador Kirkpatrick has resumed her position as Levy Professor at Georgetown University and a Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, both positions she held prior to serving the United Nations. She continues to be nationally and internationally known for her distinguished service and political insight. Please welcome Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. I thank you for that accurate introduction that, uh, and that warm welcome. I thought I would talk tonight about America's continuing efforts to play a constructive role, preserve the peace for ourselves, and uh, contribute to the stability since World War II. I think our foreign policy since World War II can be usefully viewed as a kind of continuing search for world order. And the fact that it hasn't necessarily worked out quite as we expected doesn't necessarily mean it hasn't been a good effort. We've made various efforts, tried various alternatives. Right now, I think we're at a new juncture when all of our arrangements are beginning to come unstuck again, and we may have to try some yet new ways of seeking to preserve peace and our security. 
and to contribute to democracy and freedom in the world. But I think in thinking about that, what might work, what might not work, how high the cost would be, how great the probabilities of success, it's useful to look a little at what we've already tried because that not only serves as a kind of uh, caution about the future, but it illuminates uh, some possibilities that are open to us and not open to us in the present. I think if we look at the US policy fashioned in the World War II period, what we can see is that as in World War I, when we burst onto the international scene, uh, the United States had took a look at the world, saw the way it ran its affairs, and thought uh, we ought to do better. Uh, we, having entered the world, decided to try to remake it. You remember that Woodrow Wilson tried this after World War I. The United States emerged from a period of isolationism, joined in World War I in time to uh, help save the Allies, and then set about trying to create a world order through the League of Nations. Woodrow Wilson was sure that uh, this was the way to go. He was convinced, as Franklin Roosevelt later became convinced, that there was no good reason the world couldn't solve its problems very much as the United States did, namely by getting together to work on them, providing that we tried to work them out under a, a good constitution. So Woodrow Wilson wrote the League of Nations Charter. It was largely his product. And after World War II, when we had found an, ourselves participating in an even more devastating war, Franklin Roosevelt and his closest allies and friends in the United States and in the world decided to try once more to establish a world organization, a world parliament that could bring peace in our times and maintain peace and solve conflicts that kept arising among nations. The United Nations was built in the very ashes of war. They represented the hopes and, above all, the plans of the American leaders. American leaders couldn't but believe that after the terrible carnage of World War II, it would be possible to establish a world organization that would, in the words of the UN Charter, save succeeding generations from the scourge of war by requiring that members act in accordance with the principle of respect for the sovereign equality of all states, the peaceful resolution of disputes, the non-use or threat of use of force, and non-intervention in internal affairs of other nations. The founding of the United Nations was a real American project. It was we who were most enthusiastic about it, we who were most convinced it would work, we who did most of the groundwork for its founding, and uh, in doing it, I think, and a lot of other people think, that uh, we were behaving in a very American way. We were trying to eliminate war by judicial means. Actually, we'd been dreaming that dream for a long time. We'd already tried to outlaw war three times in this century, with the Hague Convention in 1907, the League of Nations in 1919, and the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928. Now we were trying again. We really believed and I think a lot of Americans still believe, that it ought to be possible to control the dangerous and violent aspirations of nations, some nations anyway, by some system of law and restraint. So we ought to be able to develop a system of law that would restrain would-be outlaws. George Kennan, one of the great uh, diplomats and scholars of diplomacy, put it this way. He wrote, to the American mind, it's implausible that people should have positive aspirations, ones that they regard as legitimate, that are more important to them than peace and orderliness of international life. 
From this standpoint, it is not apparent, that is to Americans, why other people should not join us in accepting the rules of the game of international politics, just as we accept such rules in competition of sport, in order that the game may not become too cruel and too destructive. The United Nations was based on the assumption that nations would value peace above territorial acquisitions, that they would submit disputes to international adjudication, that they would keep agreements and that they would live by the principles of the UN Charter. In other words, that they would want peace more than they wanted conquest. Um, the UN Charter foresaw, and Americans believed, that if an outlaw arose who refused to live by these legal rules, then the other nations in the world, who would be law-abiding nations, would quite literally join together to function as world policemen and call the outlaw to order, like a posse in a western town might in case of a, an outlaw form get together and uh, go out and uh, bring him in, try to reason with him, and if necessary, force him. That's what we expected that the world was going to be like under the UN after World War II. The fact that the UN Charter had, in fact, been violated even before it was ratified didn't make much difference to the initial enthusiasm about it. You can't just say, well, Franklin Roosevelt was such an idealist, he wasn't realistic. Even that great realist, Harry Truman, whom I think was one of the most realistic of our post-war rulers, even that great realist, Harry Truman, believed that henceforth the United Nations should be the foundation stone of U.S. policy. He said, as a matter of fact, in his inaugural address in 1948, when he enunciated Point 4, which was the first technical assistance program for less developed nations, that his Point 1 would be that henceforth the U.N. would be the ground on which the U.S. would base its policies. Um, the fact is, of course, that the conditions permitting that kind of optimism didn't last very long. It's difficult today, 40 years later, to recall how bad things were in the Europe of the post-war period, how devastated the cities were and the economies, how disorganized the societies were in the wake of war, how aggressive the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin was behaving, and how unruly the indigenous communist parties were in both France and Italy. It's easy, too, to forget, 40 years later, that there was not a great tradition of democracy in Germany and in Italy. They had, after all, just emerged from great dictatorships. That was a period in which the shadow of the Soviet army exercised more power over the fate of Eastern Europe than did the principles of the UN Charter. By the time the democratic government of Czechoslovakia had been overthrown in a coup, President Harry Truman, who was a realist, concluded that maybe the principles of non-intervention and non-use of force and collective security in the Charter required some kinds of reinforcement that hadn't been provided for in the UN Charter. So he started looking for other ways to promote order and stability. It's easy to forget the intimidation and outright aggression of those years in the late 40s, how events in Poland and Hungary and Finland and Czechoslovakia dramatized the danger that confronted Greece and Italy and the prospects for all the other democracies in Europe. Harry Truman thought that Western Europe was about to be swallowed by the Soviet advance, and he called a special session of Congress. And he solemnly warned the Congress, I quote, Since the close of hostilities, the Soviet Union and its agents have destroyed the independence and democratic character of a whole series of nations in Eastern and Central Europe. It is this ruthless course of action and the design to extend it to the remaining free nations of Europe that have brought about the critical situation in Europe today. 
The tragic death of the Republic of Czechoslovakia has sent a shock throughout the civilized world. This is Harry Truman still talking. Now pressure is being brought to bear on Finland to the hazard of the entire Scandinavian peninsula. Greece is under direct military attack from the rebels actively supported by her communist-dominated neighbors. In Italy, a determined and aggressive effort is being made by a communist minority to take control of that country. The methods vary, but the pattern is all too clear. Now, there was something very new in this statement of Harry Truman's to the Congress. It was the identification of American security with countries beyond our borders, beyond the Atlantic Ocean. The very idea of identifying our security with them was very unsettling to many Americans. Uh, it was a very great departure from traditional American practice. And it was very hotly disputed. The late Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio was one of the leaders of the opposition to NATO. And he warned strongly and repeatedly against ratification of the NATO treaty. He said, addressing the Senate in 1949 on this subject, I quote, this is interesting to hear today. By executing a treaty of this kind, we put ourselves at the mercy of the foreign policies of 11 other nations and do so for a period of 20 years, because the NATO treaty was for 20 years originally. The Monroe Doctrine, said Taft, left us free to determine the merits of each dispute that might arise and to judge the justice and the wisdom of war in the light of the circumstances at the time. But the present treaty obligates us to go to war if certain facts occur. The North Atlantic Treaty was forged as a very direct response to the actual imminent danger to Western Europe and the Soviet subversion and aggression in Western Europe at that time. Uh, Truman described to the Congress a speech in a speech to the joint session uh, in March 17, 48, I stood by the Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, as he signed his name on behalf of the United States to a treaty that was the first peacetime military alliance concluded by the United States since the adoption of our Constitution. This was, said Harry Truman, one more step in the evolution of U.S. foreign policy along with the Greek-Turkish aid program and the Marshall Plan. It was a dramatic break with our tradition and our history, and it is one of the great success stories of the century. The United Nations didn't turn out to behave as anticipated, uh, but NATO has. In Germany and France and Italy, the NATO Treaty and the Marshall Plan and the Greek-Turkey Doctrine helped to serve as a shield behind which the democracies of Western Europe recovered their strength. And they have today so far recovered their strength that they've become among our greatest competitors, of course, um, but also the strongest democracies in the world, perhaps next to us. Those policies, and the NATO Treaty particularly, have, I think, produced 40 years of peace in Europe. That's the longest period of peace that Western Europe has enjoyed in more than two centuries, 42 years now. The security and stability of Europe are so great, and the alliance has been so successful that there has not, since it was founded, been any confrontation of the Soviet Union and Western Europe, no east-west confrontation in Europe. The, there have been confrontations in Soviet expansion in a lot of other parts of the world, but not in Western Europe. The relative cooperation and cohesion among European states, uh, moreover, that have fought each other in the past has been remarkable, and um, that cohesion has led, of course, to the founding of the European community and the common market and uh, all the 
stability and development and growth and prosperity associated with those institutions. Actually, what exists in Western Europe today is exactly what Harry Truman and Dean Acheson, the American Congress, and all Americans, I think, hoped and worked and contributed to. Prosperous, independent, democratic nations, strengthened by cooperation with each other and with us. Um, now, I think it's useful from time to time to stop and look at the kinds of experiences that seem to work and the kinds that don't seem to work, the kinds of plans that develop as expected and those that uh, don't. The United Nations didn't produce the result we expected. How do we know? I mean, why do I say that? Well, because the result we expected is that it would effectively eliminate war. Now, in fact, uh, scholars who study this sort of thing had estimated even before the Iran-Iraq war that there had been some 41, 42 wars, depending a little on how you define them, in the years since the UN was founded, and that more than 12 million people had died of very conventional weapons. Um, interestingly, not one of these wars took place in Europe. Um, the UN's idea of a universal organization and a universal commitment to keep peace, a world organized to maintain peace and prevent aggression, simply did not prevent war. I believe, in fact, that instead it led the United States into two wars. I think it led us into both the Korean and the Vietnamese War. In Korea, we fought as part of a UN force. The UN flag still flies over the DMZ in Korea. In Vietnam, I think the United States committed its forces because of the conviction that we must not permit aggression to succeed. That is, in both of these cases, Americans were trying to prevent an outlaw nation from achieving their goals. They were serving, if you will, as a policeman. I think that the Korean outcome was positive, and uh, I think in both wars our fighting men were brave and loyal, and they deserve all honor. But I think it's interesting to note that this hope for global absolute peace almost surely led us into two wars, as uh, surely the Vietnam War undertaken, I think, in the role of world policeman, was not a very practical investment of American resources and, above all, of American lives. Uh, our interests weren't directly involved, and um, the notion of collective security, that is, of all the other nations in the world joining together to prohibit aggression, simply had not taken hold. And all the other nations in the world didn't join in. A significant number joined in the Korean War, though we bore the brunt of that war. And a few joined in the Vietnam War, though we bore the brunt of that war. And NATO was constructed on very different principles. Uh, it was born when the UN seemed not to be succeeding. Uh, we never would have developed NATO had the UN been successfully preventing aggression and subversion. Uh, and NATO has obviously proved a far more solid basis for peace in Europe than any of the alternative efforts at collective security. And for this reason alone, I think that uh, we ought to take a look at what the principles are involved in NATO, uh, particularly now that those principles and that structure seems more and more to be uh, uncertain and uh, in doubt. We might note first that NATO is, has a permanent headquarters and forces and unified commands and regular consultations. It's institutionalized. It embodies one approach to a potential military threat. Its approach is to counter a potential force with force not because its members are belligerent or not because they seek war. In fact, they value peace. But they seek peace through their foreign policies, which include deterrence. That is, that planning 
the capacity to offset potential force with force. Uh, the very existence of NATO, I think we can say, proves that uh, the nations of Europe and the United States, Canada, who are all members of NATO, are not ready to bet their independence on the Soviet Union's good intentions. Interesting. No one has said of our largest military commitment, look for a political solution to a potential threat, huh? not a military one. We have looked for political solutions through diplomacy and maintained deterrent capacity through the institutions of NATO. NATO has some other characteristics that are, I think, very useful to reflect on. It consists of democracies, which is to say that its members share some fundamental political moral values, and generally speaking, share a Western political democratic tradition. It's interesting that it's a long-range undertaking. Its members don't expect that the problem or the need will either disappear or be eliminated in the short run, but they also don't expect to go to war in the short run either. Um, and it has also enjoyed American, not only leadership, as we like to say, but a disproportionate American commitment to the security of the allied nations throughout its history. Um, that American commitment has been based on the assumption that we have a vital stake in the survival and security of the democracies of Western Europe. We think that the industrial strength of Europe is too great to permit it to fall to potential adversaries, and that our historical and cultural ties are too strong, and Europe is too central to our civilization and to our identity. Um, we think we have a very large, even overriding, vested interest there. And that is the reason, assuredly, that the United States has kept in Europe through these now more than 40 years, um, two, three hundred, nearly 400,000 American forces in Europe as uh, a symbol of American commitment. So NATO, we can say, has worked. It's provided the security, the democracies have developed, the prosperity has developed. But now NATO, too, is growing progressively shaky. Uh, the uh, alliance is coming unstuck. We have 72 F-16s that are going to be homeless, looking for a home, like the famous bowl weaver. Um, we are going to have problems with base negotiations with Greece. That's already clear. There may be some other difficult base negotiations looming. And all those base negotiations constitute not only a uh, evidence that the United States is not really a welcome visitor in that country, but that that country no longer conceives it as worth their while to have a, a heavy American commitment symbolized in the form of military forces on their soil. Um, now our allies are beginning to worry more and more about our reliability. Some 400,000 U.S. troops in Europe today don't seem to be quite large enough an evidence to our allies of our commitment to them. That's a little strange, but that's the way it is. Particularly since Reykjavik, they have been deeply concerned about whether the United States was not about to disengage from our commitments to Europe's defense. Uh, they were shaken by Reykjavik. They believed that questions of profound concern to their security were discussed with the Soviet Union, with our prior consultation with our allies. 
They worried about um, conversations about denuclearization because they felt that nuclear power had contributed mightily to their security in the last 40 years. Europeans uh, are not at all in an anti-nuclear mode today, and they were not uh, thrilled or comforted, generally speaking, by the notion of the eliminations of, of nuclear weapons that seemed to thrill the president and, and Premier Gorbachev. Um, and they've been worried about the INF Treaty as well. The INF treaties had assumed for our allies in Europe a meaning which they have not had for us. And I think without fully recognizing that um, we proceeded once again to an agreement without full advanced consultation with our allies who felt their security was on the line and in jeopardy. We had believed that the Pershings and the cruise missiles were there in order to um, offset the SS-20 that the Soviets had installed. We thought, therefore, that if we could work out a deal in which the SS-20s were withdrawn, it would make good sense to withdraw the Pershings and cruise missiles, since the reason for their being there would have disappeared. What we didn't realize is what I think more and more people have come to understand now, and which is, by the way, uh, I think extremely insightfully discussed in an article today in the Wall Street Journal by Karen Elliott House, in case you want to take a look at it. Uh, I recommend it. It is what we fail to understand fully was that the Pershing and Cruise missiles had become a symbol for our allies. If the 20s were withdrawn, it would make good sense to withdraw the Pershings and cruise missiles since the reason for their being there would have disappeared. What we didn't realize is what I think more and more people have come to understand now and which is, by the way, uh, I think extremely insightfully discussed in an article today in the Wall Street Journal by Karen Elliott House, in case you want to take a look at it. Uh, I recommend it. It is what we fail to understand fully was that the Pershing and cruise missiles had become a symbol for our allies, not just a counterforce to the Soviet SS-20s, but a symbol of, and a token, really, uh, of American involvement in the nuclear defense of Western Europe. It had come to symbolize for our allies the U.S. presence and commitment to the defense of Western Europe against nuclear attack. And um, therefore, they feel deeply disturbed at the removal of that symbol of U.S. commitment and that symbol of linkage of U.S. Uh, European defense of Europe in case of a nuclear attack on Europe. Um, I don't know whether that's reasonable. I'm sure that that's happened. Um, there's a, another fact which disturbs them a lot about the INF Treaty, though they don't talk about it as much as publicly. They talk about it a lot and semi-publicly in Britain and in Germany and in France and in Belgium. Um, and they say the sort of thing that Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger wrote about the INF Treaty. Uh, those two men wrote, and I quote, in, by the way, in their first collaboration since uh, Nixon left office in Watergate, uh, they wrote, if we eliminate American medium and short range forces in Europe without redressing the conventional imbalance, the Soviet nuclear threat to Europe will remain. And the gap in deterrence of conventional attack will be reopened. They see this. They, they feel this. They feel that uh, deterrence requires balanced deterrence for every level of uh, possible attack. Not only deterrence of long-range missiles against long-range missiles, but also deterrence of medium-range missiles against medium-range missiles, and of course, above all, they fear that the withdrawal of the missiles will leave them exposed to the Soviets' great conventional superiority. And uh, they worry. Now, they also worry, 
about some other things that we're worrying about. They worry about the decline in America's apparent preeminence in the world. And that surely is uh, the big news of this season, is the obvious, visible decline in American economic preeminence. And they fear that it's linked to a decline in American military preeminence. And um, they're accustomed to a world in which the United States was stronger than everybody, and in which we bore uh, enormous burdens not only on our own behalf, but on the behalf of a great many other countries, and that made it a much easier world for them, let me say. It's perfectly clear now that the United States is caught up in uh, a lot of uh, new global vulnerabilities. The most dramatic of these new global vulnerabilities is our, perhaps our uh, financial vulnerability, which I think no nation, no business, no investor can escape today. Um, it's fairly clear that we simply do not have the preeminence that we used to have. The rising productivity of the nations of Western Europe has made them sensitive to the power of the European community vis-a-vis -vis us. The rising technological and economic power of Japan has been accompanied by very impressive performance of other countries in the Pacific Basin. Soviet Union's dramatic growth from a single European power to a great global empire has uh, extended the Soviet reach all over the world. And the United States is today uh, reeling. Our European friends notice it. Our Japanese friends notice it. And we notice it. You know, um, we used to be, only recently, the world's leading exporter. But we're not the world's leading exporter anymore. Today, Germany is the world's leading exporter. We're number two. Japan is number three. Um, in volume terms, we're still the leading expert, exporter, but the declining dollar has reduced the value of the trade, and the balance of trade is measured in dollars, not in volume. Um, today, the whole world who's interested in this sort of thing knows that Japan is now the home of nine out of 10 of the world's largest banks, where only recently the United States clearly dominated international banking. Of the world's 10 largest corporations today, Japan's Nippon Telegraph and Telephone leads the list. IBM is second, Exxon is third, and the remaining seven corporate giants are all Japanese. It's an open secret. Almost everybody notices. Uh, most of our friends think that uh, we're out living our means, that we're living above our means. Somebody has suggested that uh, our situation is rather like Errol Flynn once described his own. He said, my problem, in, sorry, my problem lies in reconciling my gross habit with my net income. Uh, a lot of people think we've developed some pretty gross habits and that it's, they've outstripped our net income, that we can't quite afford the level at which we are living. There is um, a lot of doubt about whether we are as competitive as we should be or are whether we are as going to be as competitive in the future as we are today. There's a new book, um, well, not so new, produced and published by the Harvard Business School Press called Ideology and National Competitiveness. And uh, the authors, or the editors, George Lodge and Ezra Vogel, and eight other specialists look at the changes in nine major nations and rank the comparative competitive advantage. And this is the way they rank nine major nations. But it's our Declaration of Independence from which you read. Um, and. Uh, May I uh, 
say that I, you know, I think that those are our ideals and that um, we seek to affirm them. We seek to affirm them. It's a document written by Americans, by the way, for Americans, but about our views about others as well as Americans. You know, it is a fact. What it says is what you said. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creators with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, I think that's a fair statement of basic American beliefs. I think we believe that, finally, the only basis for just government is the consent of the governed, and that the only appropriate purpose for government is the protection of the rights of citizens. Um, I think that it is perfectly legitimate for Americans to give priority to the protection of their nation's interests and principles. I think it's perfectly appropriate for Liberia to do that, and for France to do it, and uh, for any country, in fact, to do so. I think that's the way nations behave. And uh, our principles, in my opinion, are exactly those uh, which you stated and which our declaration states. And our interests include the survival of a world in which free nations and free people can survive and thrive in this continent and in Africa and um, in Asia and in Europe. Um, you know, I don't think we're perfect. And I think we've made mistakes. And I think we've uh, sometimes uh, you know, behaved perhaps insensitively to other countries. But I will tell you this, I believe that our record is a strong one. And that it is uh, not only includes uh, really, really quite great fidelity to our principles in our internal life, in our society, always working toward those goals, but also in the world, and quite a measure, in fact, of generosity. Um, I feel very comfortable stacking it beside the record of any other contemporary nation. And uh, that's that. Uh, yeah. In viewing the uh, INF Treaty, first of all, uh, could it be viewed as an attempt by the United States to lessen its burden of the defense of NATO nations and trying to prod them into uh, bearing more of their own burden, number one? And number two, do you feel it is legitimate for the U.S., even in view of declining influence in the world, to relinquish this strength in NATO? I think it is viewed that way by a great many uh, NATO nations. That's uh, a point I wanted to make. I don't think it was our intention, but I think it's one, one of the, the consequences of the INF Treaty. Um, but I don't think it was one of our intentions. I don't think we ought to, I think we should preserve NATO and we should do our best to preserve NATO. And we should continue U.S. membership in it, and uh, I don't think we need, however, to bear quite the share of the burdens of the defense of all these rich, smart, powerful, technologically advanced countries. I think that we can have a little redistribution of burdens there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I personally feel that mm -hmm. most of uh, people are striving for peace in the world. But I don't think Mr. Well, President Reagan's idea for the uh, arms treaty was for that goal. I personally feel that it was to avoid have his, having his presidency marked by a RAN scam. Do you feel the same way? And what is your opinion? No, and let me just tell you, I know something about this. Um, I, uh, I really do. This is, um, you know, the, the zero option was devised 
in the US government and approved by Ronald Reagan and submitted to the Soviet Union in 1981. And at least it was approved in 1981 and submitted soon thereafter. Now, it could not possibly have been in response. The only reason it wasn't adopted earlier is that the Soviets declined. They rejected it out of hand initially. And this was the period in which they walked out of the arms talks in Geneva, and they said they would not discuss the zero option. They denounced it as a fraud. They're the ones who changed their minds. And they later came back to the US proposal, which they had rejected in the beginning of Ronald Reagan's terms. The reason you can be sure that he didn't propose it in order to try to overcome the uh, image of Iran scam is that he proposed it five years in advance of Iran scam. Um, this relates in part to the uh, gentleman from Liberia's statement. Um, do you feel that uh, there's any possibility that uh, the U.S. is mere presence in Europe and the Middle East and in South America could possibly be exacerbating the problems that occur, the dissension, aggression? No. No, I don't think so. You want to know why? Certainly. <laughs> uh, first of all, because the problem is, if, you know, as I said in my speech, you have to think about what comes first. And wh what is a response to what? In Europe, for example, what came first was a great deal of deliberate uh, subversion and aggression in the years after World War II. And that was at a point that the United States had no role in Europe at all. That's uh, just not. And the US the development of the Marshall Plan, for example, and then of the NATO Treaty, was to deal with the problems of subversion and aggression which existed. So we couldn't imagine that the US presence caused the subversion and aggression because it came after and was a response to it. So that's what I would say. Um, I would like to know if you would accept the offer from Jack Kemp if he um, gets the nomination for President of the United States. <laughs> If you would be his running mate in 88. Uh, you know what I will tell you? I would tell you, no matter whose name you had put in there, uh, I would tell you, I do not deal in hypothetical questions. I, uh, I am, um, that's a very hypothetical question. I am married to a very wise man. He's a Hoosier, by the way. And, uh, I've learned many things from him. One of the things I learned was about not spending my time dealing with what he calls the question of what will I do if my grandmother dies next Thursday. <laughs> uh, you know, the odds are always against it, and uh, I have a lot of other things to do. Jack Kemp is a personal friend of mine. I think very highly of him, uh, and I simply don't spend my time thinking about what I might do in case something else happens one way or the other. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for being here this evening, Ambassador Kirkpatrick. Um, appreciate your stating that the purpose of government is to protect individual rights. Taking that, then I assume that one of the reasons we're opposed to the Soviet Union is because the purpose of that government is not to protect individual rights. Mm -hmm. Why then have a relationship with the Soviet Union, especially when it seems like the only reason they prefer to have a relation, uh, talking about a formal diplomatic relationship with us, is so that they can keep enough personnel in this country to keep ripping off our technology. Why not tell the Russians that if they wish this relationship to continue, that they would do well to abandon their expansionist plans in the Western Hemisphere and then we'll think about it. Oh, you know, I said uh, about the, uh, what I said is that I don't think we think any government is a just government, which is not based, which is, whose purpose is not to defend the rights of its citizens. And uh, I think that's right. I mean, I think that's true for the Soviet Union as well as any other government which is 
fundamentally a dictatorship, whether it's a bureaucratic dictatorship or a simpler military dictatorship. Uh, I don't think we think those governments are just governments. Um, I think that it's true the Soviets engage in a great deal of industrial espionage. You remember when the Soviets, there was a big spy scandal in France two years ago, which they kicked out some 47 Soviet spies and captured a lot of documents at the same time and found that the Soviets had a, a five-year plan for industrial espionage in France, just like they had a five-year plan for the development of you know, the steel industry or something. Um, the, um, that's too bad. I mean, I wish they wouldn't do that. Um, I don't think, you know, that it's useful, though, for the United States not to have diplomatic relations with the Soviets. Because, the, you know, well, what we approve and what we hope for and what we desire and what we work for uh, is all very important and should be our guide. We also have to live and survive in the world. And the Soviet Union is a very important power in the world. And um, I think, generally speaking, that it is better for us to be uh, you know, diplomatically involved with them and uh, to talk to them and to uh, take their measure, if you will. And it's better for them to know us. I'm glad Gorbachev came to the United States. You know, I went to the Moscow last year, met with the heads of Soviet government, including Gorbachev, in fact, and most other leaders in the foreign policy and security field. I think that's useful to know heads of state. I don't think that our disputes are personal, and I don't think that getting acquainted personally solves the disputes, but I think it's useful for heads of nations to know each other. At least it eliminates unnecessary misunderstandings. I wish Gorbachev knew us better, in fact. I, you know, if he knew us better, he might understand that we don't share any goals and desires of conquest. He doesn't, you know, he might, if he knew us better, he might understand that we're not governed by a military industrial complex. He doesn't understand that. Uh, I just don't think it would help to achieve our goals to sever relations with Soviet. If I did, I'd be for it, but I really don't. Um, I'm participating in uh, Political Science 392, which is studying the United Nations and um, other international organizations. And I did a paper recently on Cyprus, and I was just concentrating on the UN involvement. Good luck. Now, <laughs> earlier you were saying how successful NATO is, and I agree with you, but two NATO countries, Greece and Turkey, okay, the, in Cyprus, only 18% of the island is Turkish Cypriots. The clear majority is the Greek Cypriots. Yet Turkey invaded Cyprus under the guise of preserving peace and protecting its Turkish Cypriots and occupies 40% of the land. And what I'm interested in is what the United States policy is towards that, if there is any policy. I read certain articles, but I can never, it never really clearly delineated what the United States felt about that and what my, their efforts might be towards that problem that is in I am about Europe. to confess something that I have never said in a public place. When I went to the United Nations, I, I plunged into this learning about the substantive disputes which were being discussed at the United Nations, which, which really meant sort of all the subjects concerning all the countries, you know. Uh, all the subjects in the world and all the countries in the world. Um, and I tried very hard. I worked very long hours, and I read in endless stacks of communications, papers, background papers. But I was briefed for hours and months and years on end. And there was only one problem that I decided, this is so complicated that I am not going to get involved with it. And it was Cyprus. <laughs> That's... Uh, that's my first public confession of that fact. Um, the Cyprus problem, I will only say to you that uh, at the UN, a majority of countries and uh, the UN observer doesn't see it like you just stated. Since I decided not to really become involved personally in this Cypriot dispute, 
I am not going to try to explain to you today the U.S. <laughs> position. I barely understand anybody's position in the Cypriot dispute. It is the most incredibly complex diplomatic dispute. It's taken place in so many arenas. Um, and the, I have listened. I mean, I've, I've, the Greek ambassador has met with me, and the Turkish ambassador, and the Cypriot ambassador, and I know them in Washington, too. But I have never really devoted enough time to the background of the subject to express an opinion or to even state the U.S. position in a fashion that I would have any confidence in. Thank Sorry. You. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, one of the issues that's going to be coming up very soon, in fact, on the third, a week from today. I don't is, mean to discourage you against doing it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Is the issue over aid to the Nicaraguan democratic resistance? In your opinion, is there any way that we can work within the structure of the Arias plan to bring peace and democracy to Nicaragua, or are the Contras the only opportunity we have there? Well, first of all, the Arias plan, which I supported very warmly, let me say, uh, was a plan, not simply a hope. And uh, it laid out some very specific conditions, like free assembly, free press, general amnesty, ceasefire, and internal reconciliation, um, democratic elections. It also provided a time frame. Unlike any previous Central American peace plan, it did lay down some specific indicators and uh, by which we could judge whether what it wanted to happen, whether, you know, whether the signatories had kept their promises. And it provided a time frame, and that time frame has now elapsed. I think it is entirely right and proper that the United States should have suspended uh, further deliveries of lethal weapons to the Contras during the period that the Arias plan was in operation. Uh, the first deadline for the Arias plan, as I'm sure you know, was January 6th. It was extended by the five presidents to January 15th. And uh, at that time, it was found that Nicaragua was not in compliance. Now, the president said to the Nicaraguan government, basically, uh, you know, either you've just got to shape up immediately or quit pretending that you're going to keep these promises. And um, they haven't done it, but they've, they've done some things. Now, obviously, we would all much rather see the Nicaraguan government provide free speech free press, free trade unions, free economy, uh, free elections to their people, general amnesty, ceasefire. We, I mean, that's what I hope for. I suppose it's what we all hope for. The, you know, I don't have any confidence in them keeping their promises, however. The reason I don't have any confidence is that they've made those promises before. And they've not kept them before. They made those promises in writing in June 1979 to the Organization of American States. And uh, they didn't keep them then. I hope they will keep them now. I will uh, personally, uh, you know, uh, think that it would be uh, irresponsible of the United States to cease support for the Nicaragua's resistance at this time until we have further evidence that there is going to be democracy in Nicaragua. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, one more question. South Africa. Right. You mentioned that um, South African wealth is threatened by, I quote your own words, ugly, conflicting... Um, An ugly, uh, bitter conflict. Yeah, I ugly conflicting something. Okay, could you be more right. explicit? Sure. Because I, I think these words oh. are very strong. Well, of course. Uh, I, right. I would be very happy to be. I was talking about this, all of these from the perspective of the United States, the kinds of problems we're confronted with in policy. And South African conflict is, of course, a bitter, ugly struggle, which I said I thought was likely to get worse which is based on the denial of equal rights
to South Africans who are black and South Africans who are colored. And uh, on the efforts of some of those black and colored South Africans to respond to this denial of their rights mm. by force and uh, to respond or to conduct that battle not only against uh, whites who uh, represent the white officials, but also against blacks who have different ideas about how best to achieve racial equality and uh, democratic, multiracial democratic South Africa. Um, that's what I meant. Okay, yeah. and my second question is, um, Reagan doesn't want to accept the Five Nation Plan. I'm, I'm talking about the Nic Nicaraguan War. Central American Peace yes, Corps, I mean, right. Central America. Okay. Right. But at the same time, Reagan accepts to negotiate with the most communist, communist country while he's afraid to negotiate with, I mean, I would the, just like the, to the say contract. to you, so how two, two do you things. explain this paradox? Okay, may I say two things about that? Uh, one is that the, the Ronald Reagan and the Reagan administration did, in fact, accept the Central American Peace Accord and uh, indicated their support and their hope for their success. And that was real. And second, we have diplomatic relations with Nicaragua. Nicaragua has an ambassador in Washington. We have an ambassador in Managua. We have conversations with the government of Nicaragua all the time. And we have, at certain pastimes, engaged in certain other bilateral relation, negotiations with Nicaragua about problems in the region. But fundamentally, the United States government, of which I am not a part, believes that the problems of Central American nations should uh, be negotiated by the countries of Central America. And that's what the Central American Peace Accords do. The United States is not willing to try to negotiate a, with Nicaragua about the future of El Salvador of, or Honduras. And uh, I think they're right. Thank you. It's been nice to be with you tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador Kirkpatrick, for honoring us with your presence and for those most provocative remarks, and thank you very much for coming.